Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about the platform economy and the role of platforms and APIs in creating new value in the era of digital transformation. When we think about digital transformation, we often talk about uh, changing the enterprise, changing uh, to agile, changing our backend, changing our data silos, and so on. But when we really think about the value that digital transformation brings, we need to start thinking about the fundamental nature of how data impacts business models, how uh, the creation of digital markets unlocks new value. And so to start with uh, framing this idea of platforms and API, I want to start by putting forward a mental model about how to think about the value that gets unlocked because of platforms and APIs and because of digital. The way to think about it is that if you think of the evolution of the internet or evolution of technology over the last 20, 25 years, what we notice that every time a specific component or variable denoting supply or demand in the market was digitized, a whole new range of market interactions were enabled. And this enabled the creation of entirely new companies, enabled unlocking of entirely new value. And that's what makes digital transformation fundamentally exciting. Let's take a couple of examples over here. Think of the late 90s when we started seeing companies like Amazon digitizing consumption for the first time. Before this, consumption used to be captured in the form of uh, data in a sales receipt. So you'd go to a retailer and you would pay for something and that data about what you purchased was captured in the sales receipt, but it was never used to create value back in the business. What Amazon did was it took all of this data and it used collaborative filtering to create entirely new market interactions. So if you go to Amazon and it's, it, it says people who bought this also bought this, that's essentially a, a prompt to move you to new market interactions using data about the purchases that people have made in the past. So consumption data started unlocking new value in the late 90s. What we saw in the early 2000s was that we started seeing the rise of social networks, but to a large extent, identity was still not verified on the internet. Our digital identity was not verifiable and hence the creation of trust was difficult. What Facebook did was for the first time, it digitized identity in a way that it could be verified and that it could be used to create trust and market interaction. And then in 2008, Facebook opened this out uh, in, uh, to, to the whole world in the form of Facebook Connect. So if you use a third party application and it allows you to log in with Facebook, you're using Facebook Connect to verify your identity over there. And the fact that your identity was verified on Facebook originally by tying it to uh, a, a university email or a company email in the early days, that enabled that verification to happen for real world transactions to verify your identity. And because of the opening of Facebook Connect in 2008, you start seeing the rise of the sharing economy 2008 onwards. Companies like Airbnb, TaskRabbit, Zali, these started coming up around that time because identity had been digitized. We see another important development around the same time. In the mid 2000s, Google acquired a company called Keyhole Technologies, which eventually became Google Maps. And uh, uh, we started seeing uh, the rise of the enterprise cloud uh, or, or the consumer cloud in the early uh, to mid 2000s as well. So in 2007, 3G connectivity started becoming very powerful. Apple essentially launched a smartphone, which now put a computer in your pocket by combining 3G connectivity with an app hosted on the cloud so that a thin app could run on your phone and complex computations could be done on, on the cloud. And the combination of having a computer in your pocket and having digitized location through Google Maps allowed new location-based services like Uber and Foursquare to come up. So location got digitized around this time once we combined the power of Google Maps with the power of a computer in our pockets. And so we see that whenever a new component of supply or demand gets digitized for the first time, the digitization of location, for instance, digitizes a moving car and allows a moving car to be connected and matched to a request for the ride. Whenever we see a new component of demand or supply being digitized, we start seeing the potential for new market interactions. And that's how new value gets unlocked in the digital economy. What we've seen over the last seven to 10 years is new forms of digitization. We've seen the digitization of reputation. 
and post COVID as more work goes remote, the digitization of reputation is becoming increasingly more important because if you've got to hire the freelancer uh, remotely, you need information about their reputation and digitized reputation helps over there. We also started seeing uh, with the rise of the Internet of Things, the digitization of machine performance. Digital twins of machines are now being created because of which machines can be digitized and a view of the entire industrial process can be created because of the data coming out of the machines. And the final thing that we're beginning to see is that with the enterprise shifting to the cloud, workflows and business processes are getting digitized. And what happens is once we move a workflow from a siloed software to a cloud hosted software, which can now interact and connect with other cloud hosted software, you've now digitized and made more fluid the data about that particular workflow or process. So if you combine these three things, the digitization of worker reputation, human reputation, combined with the digitization of machine performance, combined with the digitization of process performance, you can now digitize entire industrial systems. Com essentially, every industrial system is composed of humans, of machines, and of processes that align their actions and uh, activities. And as, you, as we see with these three shifts, all these things are increasingly getting digitized. You can now not only have a digitized machine or a digitized shop flow, a shop flow worker, but you can have a digitized process end-to-end, -end, which consists of multiple machines generating data on the shop floor, multiple workers working with it, and multiple workflow management tools managing all of this data. You can then use this digitized process and enable it to interact with an external process in another company, and through that, entire value chains are increasingly getting digitized. And this is where the power of platforms and APIs really comes through, because once we start digitizing supply and demand in this fashion, once we start digitizing every value creating component in a value chain. We can restructure business models in a way that was not possible in the past. So let's get to that. But before we get to that, I want to talk about very quickly taking a step back, talk about what exactly we mean when we say platforms, because the word platform is widely misunderstood. And to really understand that, we need to understand that today, as processes start getting digitized, as um, new value is being created because of uh, every component of the value chain becoming digitized, you can, you can have new companies so specialized that they do exactly one, one activity in the value chain, convert it into an API that can be embedded into every other company's process. And we see a company like Stripe, for example, doing exactly that by embedding its payments functionality across a whole range of different processes. Think of a company like Smart Car, which digitizes every function on the car, which then allows third party developers to access those functionalities on the car. And so what we're seeing is the, the creation of micro value, the creation of the, the, the unbundling and, and uh, the, the creation of unique unitary value propositions. And you can build entire companies around single unitary value propositions compared to uh, how we used to build things in the past where we used to vertically integrate multiple products, multiple parts of the value chain, we can now increasingly see greater specialization. Now where this leads us is that with the rise of digitization and with the rise of specialization, we're seeing a fundamental shift in value creation and in business models. Traditionally, value was created in highly vertically integrated companies that worked like a pipeline, where a single company would integrate across um, infrastructure, uh, ownership, product creation, customer service. It would manage the end-to-end -end pipeline. It would create the product, ship it to the customer, and the customer would pay for it. So it was a very linear flow of value, very resource intensive, process intensive. What we're seeing with increasing digitization, increasing connectivity, increasing data, is that the most powerful companies today instead leverage a platform-based model where the platform creates a central infrastructure into which external parties, producers and consumers can connect, create value, exchange value with each other. And the platform business in itself does not act as the sole creator of products and services. The majority of values created in this ecosystem of producers and consumers exchanging value with each other, interacting with each other. And the role of the platform over here is to provide the central infrastructure and create the, the set the terms of governance in terms of what interactions are 
allowed, which ones are encouraged, which ones are not encouraged. So the platform is very much an, in an infrastructure and a governance mechanism to enable entirely new markets of value creation at various points in the value chain. So if you think of it, we moved from a place where we would want to own the whole value chain through vertical integration to now specializing and providing open infrastructures where highly specialized players can plug in and interact with each other. Let's take a few examples of what exactly this means from business perspective, because when you think about platforms, they create a lot of opportunity. They seemingly create a lot of opportunity because every platform benefits from something called network effects. When more producers connect onto a platform, the choice of supply increases on the platform. That attracts even more consumers. As more consumers come in, the value of the platform as an influence mechanism, as a channel, becomes more powerful and so more producers come in as well. So network effects constantly increase value on the platform and producers and consumers both benefit from this increased value because they're able to access more of the market. But at the same time, there's a flip side to the uh, uh, platform economy as well. Um, when you think about network effects and when you think even more so about say data network effects, where more providers of data bring in data into the platform and the platform accumulates all of this data and benefits from it. When you think about these factors, network effects, data network effects, this increasing accumulation in the platform and hence increasing dependence for the various stakeholders on the platform. Think of learning effects as well. Think of the Facebook newsfeed, where the more we train the algorithm, the better that knows us, the more addicted we get. So there's more value in the training, but there's also increased dependence. And that's the flip side of the platform economy. We need to understand that platforms do not just create value, they also increase concentration. That's why some of the biggest companies in the world today, some of the fastest growing companies in the world today are all leveraging platform business models. Another thing to think about is that platforms, a, a big narrative around platforms is that they are open and uh, you know we have companies like Google saying don't be evil or Facebook trying to ch change the world. We've now in 2021, we've realized that, you know, a lot of those are just narratives. So what's important to understand is what does openness exactly mean? Because we increasingly talk about open business models and open economy. What we need to understand is the flip side to openness is a new form of control. And whether you're running a platform or participating on other platforms, you need to understand the notion of this new form of control. That to me is the single most important and the least understood aspect of the platform economy. With all forms of openness, there's some form of control that comes in. What happens in the platform economy is there's a constant tension between being open and controlling. Think of uh, something like Google, uh, apparently the search engine is open. Uh, anybody can uh, you know, set up a website and be ranked on Google, but increasingly you have to keep managing your website to rank on Google and so you have to follow Google's terms and conditions in the form of search engine optimization. That's a new form of control. Let's take an even more interesting example over here. Think of Android. Android started as this apparent open ecosystem where anybody could come and create a phone, third-party app developers could come and create new apps. Unlike Apple, which was supposed to be closed, Android was open and hence apparently even more benevolent than uh, some of the other options out there. And what Android realized pretty early on was that there's a price to openness, which is the lack of control. So what happened was by being open, Android allowed LG, Samsung, Amazon, all of these companies to come in, fork the operating system, create their own version of Android, and hence create the App Store on top of their own version of Android. So the power of owning the App Store shifted away from Android to LG, Samsung, and all of these other companies. That's when Google realized that it needed a new form of control. And so Google started setting up a new set of control points. First, Google realized that it had something called Google Maps, which was a really powerful asset in this ecosystem. Because a phone needs mapping for navigation. Self-driving cars need mapping for navigation. And so Google Maps is a very important control point. Google took maps away from the open Android infrastructure captured it inside its, its closed um, Google Play system and required partners, uh, phone developers, etc., to license Google Play in addition to taking up Android. And 
these partners also had to join the Open Handset Alliance, which prevented them from setting up their own app stores. So Google Maps allowed them to create that uh, control mechanism that then ensured that Google could dictate terms to the partners. Google Cloud Messaging was another such control point because Google Cloud Messaging enables developers to send messages to users, notifications on Android phones and so on. Now, while that can be replicated, Google Cloud Messaging is just one of those additional things that when taken away from open Android and put inside Google Play, makes Google Play much more attractive for developers than building for the open Android uh, system. And so increasingly, Google started pushing more value away from Android into Google Play. It was not just a rebranding exercise, it was a way to bring the App Store away from these various partners and back to Google. And that's how Google used Maps as a way to set up a control point and create its own ecosystem. Companies like Amazon failed because they, uh, their whole strategy of forking Android and creating their own ecosystem no longer survived. We recently heard LG stopped its handphone business, uh, smartphone business after spending billions of dollars and now there's nobody willing to buy it because all the value shifted to Google. The value was not with the handset manufacturers anymore. And that happened because of Google's strategic choice of control points. So we've talked about concentration, we've talked about control points. Let's talk about how APIs fundamentally change the way business models work. One of the first things APIs do is they dissolve firm boundaries. They change the boundary of the firm. And what that means is that traditionally, as I mentioned, companies are vertically integrated. Companies would do everything from managing the infrastructure to, and operations to building products to serving customers. They would bring everything in-house because the cost of managing activities outside was prohibitive. They were policing costs, they were transaction costs, and all of these in the, in the, in the era of expensive communication and lack of data, anything pre-internet, the cost of managing this outside was super expensive. What's happened as a result of digitization is now the cost of managing these activities outside is not expensive anymore. You just need to make an API call and you can benefit from the specialization that another company brings. If you're a bank and somebody else has a better credit scoring model, you can start using their credit scoring model because of it's just an API call away. And so we started seeing firm boundaries dissolving. We've started seeing companies becoming more specialized. If you see a lot of startups, they just focus on one part of the value chain and start from there and expand from there. So specialization is increasingly rewarded and vertical integration or at least all types of, you know, no holds barred vertical integration is not as rewarding as it used to be because the cost of managing the activity outside the firm is not that high anymore. What happens to the result is that APIs also dissolve industry boundaries because when firm boundaries start getting dissolved, you start seeing this unbundling happen. Every element of the firm becomes an, a new company in itself. So traditionally, Companies would be vertically integrated because they needed to do everything in-house. Now that you have this unbundling, we can move to an era where things start getting rebundled. And this rebundling happens not around the product that a company is selling, but around a customer's need. That's why we're in this world of customer centricity, where you can rebundle third-party propositions and create a new proposition for the customer. If you're a mobility company, you can rebundle parts of the financial services value chain, you can rebundle parts of the healthcare value chain, uh, parts of the entertainment value chain, and provide a, a comprehensive uh, proposition to an end customer. And this is where we really see today's value creation happening. We, we talk about ecosystems and how ecosystems are different from industry boundaries. Fundamentally, that happens because of this rebundling. Initially, digitization led to unbundling. It allowed activities to be done outside the boundary of the firm. But for consumers, having to engage with multiple providers becomes very really expensive. And so what happens in the world of platforms is platforms do a lot of this rebundling. They aggregate a lot of providers, create a consistent uh, consumer experience across them. And that's how a lot of this rebundling happens. So that is why we're moving to this era where increasingly we're moving away from value of unbundling to a place where a lot of value is created through the bundling. Now, when we think about this cycle of bundled to unbundled to the bundled, 
And when we think of different industries, they're the different points in this cycle. So something like the media industry got unbundled in the late 90s and has ever since become rebundled. Music got unbundled and is now rebundled as a Spotify playlist. Um, in between, it used to be, uh, you know, anybody could share a file over, over Napster and now a lot of value is in having a Spotify playlist. And similarly, news got rebundled, uh, unbundled from the newspaper, but rebundled as a news feed and so on. So what we're seeing increasingly, the value is not just in unbundling, it's in rebundling. The value moves into rebundling. And what that does is it starts fundamentally shifting power to the few players who can do the bundling. And so industry structures fundamentally shift. Take an example of the media industry. In the, in the late uh, 90s, we saw this unbundling happen both on the supply and the demand side because traditional media companies, they specialized on creating great content and owning a distribution channel. The internet unbundled distribution and allowed anyone to distribute for free. And then new technologies like Wiki, uh, new publishing tools from companies like Adobe allowed new forms of production to happen. Anybody could now create content. And so content creation also got unbundled from the media company. What happened as a result was there was an explosion of content, explosion of distribution, and two companies, Facebook and Google, one with the newsfeed, one with the search engine, started rebundling all this content in a scalable way. In fact, if you look at uh, companies that, that try to rebundle it the old way, Yahoo, for instance, tried to rebundle this explosion of content in an editorial manner and failed because it did not scale with the, with the rate of unbundling and the rate of new content creation. So the value moves away from the commoditized media companies who become increasingly dependent on these two players to the players who manage rebundling. These two over here in particular who managed a lot of this rebundling around the customer's engagement and data. So essentially what we see is that traditional bundles like newspapers were built around the editorial functions of a company. Today's bundles, for example, a news feed is built around a user's data and their level of engagement. And that's fundamentally what's different in the new bundling. The new bundling is around the customer. It's no longer around the product value chain that the company used to have. We see the same thing happen, for example, in financial services where traditional banks had built financial products and then they had the distribution system in the form of agents and bank branches. And what we've seen is uh, we've seen the rise of open banking where financial products are becoming APIs easily embeddable in third party ecosystems. So the supply has become unbundled from the bank and uh, can be distributed anywhere. And we've also started seeing uh, the rise of new regulation like PSD2, which allows third parties to access data from the bank. And so what ends up happening now is we're going to start seeing the bundling of financial services around whoever understands the customer best, manages their credit worthiness better than traditional banks, and is then able to provide them the right financial services at the right point. And so we start seeing companies like Square, Shopify, start, uh, which, which, which have now started entering financial services. And they're also in a very good position to do a lot of this rebundling because they don't rely on financial services to make money. They make money on the software side. Uh, they also have better data because of which they are able to um, provide much better priced financial services that in turn increases adoption of, of their systems and hence even more data creation. So we're starting to see this new rebundling happen as well. Think of what happened in the telco value chain. Uh, a lot of the value in the telco value chain would sit with whoever could distribute the application. So in the late 90s, the telcos benefited from uh, a lot of the value. They would provide the, the ringtones and the other uh, value added services. With the rise of Java enabled handsets, the app could be embedded in the phone. So phone manufacturers, Nokia and Blackberry shot up in value. And now that has shifted away again with the shift in technology, apps can now be done on the cloud and 3G connectivity allows it to be done seamlessly as a thin app on the phone, a thin client on the phone. And that essentially is where Apple has rebundled the, the usage of the phone. So essentially, if you think of Nokia's phone, it was a product bundle. It was what Nokia felt was right for the customer. An iPhone is a consumer-centered bundle because I can choose any number of applications and customize my iPhone to work in a certain way for me. And so again, the bundling, the power shifts to whoever does the bundling. 
So what I want to talk about finally as we close this is that when we think about the role of technology, the power of technology is not just in optimization. The power of technology is not just, for example, in better distribution, uh, in, in uh, more informed vertical integration or in uh, you know, open consumption because you can now use the internet to um, digitize omni-channel journeys and serve customers across multiple touch points. The power really is in building ecosystems. And that happens when you fundamentally the architecture business, you fundamentally think about how can we do no, new innovation, how can we create new products by leveraging open innovation, how can we leverage external ecosystems of product creators, service providers around our business and orchestrate them, rebundle their value propositions for the customer. And how can we go beyond that and really create cross industry ecosystems because industry boundaries are dissolving. We are now moving to a place where we can take components from five different traditional value chains and create an entirely new proposition for the end customer. And that is the power of APIs. That specialization and rebundling is possible because of that API level connectivity. And the ability to manage that rebundling is possible because platforms have this central one-stop knowledge of a consumer and are able to rebundle multiple propositions towards them. And that's what makes the API economy and the platform economy really powerful. Thank you so much for listening.